Um, thank you for inviting me over. Um, I'd like to thank the Levantine Heritage Foundation and Craig and Quentin for inviting me. And it's great to see so many familiar faces uh, from all around the world. So today I'm very happy to be talking about my one of my favorite artifacts. Uh, of the 19th century, and hope you can hear me well. Is it okay now? Yeah, a bit better. Is it? Is it? Ah, uh -huh, better. better. <laughs> it needs to be louder. Yeah, yeah, that, that's better. Uh, people can turn their microphones off. Hmm. Well, okay. Shall I continue? Please. All right, so uh, I, honest, I had my um, master's thesis on Alexander Valery uh, many years ago, and today it's a pleasure to be talking about his identities, background, yes. and architecture. Uh, and the, the major sources that I, uh, I have used during my research uh, is, of course, Mustafa Akpolat's dissertation, uh, works and articles of Afife Batur, uh, Cengiz Can, um, uh, Nur Akun, and of course Paolo Girardelli. Uh, most recently, my colleague and friend Seda Kulasai had a dissertation uh, particularly focusing on Valerie, so I benefited a lot from their uh, much recent works. Uh, but today I'll, I'll try to give an overview of uh, who Valerie was and uh, I'm going to talk about his architecture a little bit, and I have selected several uh, projects where I can focus more in detail. So let's start. Um, I'm going to start with the architect's family because we are talking about Levantines, and it's it's a you know perfect example of uh, a Levantine family who moved from Italy, uh, from Torino uh, to Istanbul. So Francesco Valeri, uh, or Valori, uh, was an Italian, and he was born at the beginning of the 19th century in Italy. He was married to Anna Musante from Torino. And for some reason, at the middle of the 19th century, he came to Smyrna. And why ever he, he moved, to, uh, what brought him to Izmir? Uh, please remember that Ottoman port cities uh, were being the center of attraction, especially for the Mediterranean uh, at that time. So it was very vibrant and full of opportunities. So he wanted to try his chance in this port city. He came over and he settled down. So he married uh, for the second time, Elena Moro Papadino, and the couple had six children, Pietro, Victoria, Alexander, Eduard, Elise, and Henry. So a couple years after his move to Izmir, uh, Francesco and his ma family moved to Istanbul. So, um, we know from the local journals, Journal de Constantinople, for example, that uh, Monsieur Valery, Francesco Valery, opened a cafe on one of the uh, most important uh, urban axes of the city, Grand Rue de Pera. And 1849, Journal de Constantinople informs us that this cafe uh, was right across Hotel d'Angleterre, and he offers confectioners, liqueurs, foreign wines, conserves, syrups, chocolates, treasures, gift boxes, and also adds that Monsieur Valery offers cakes, ice cream, bonbons for a reasonable price for the balls, events, and dinners. So he became one of the uh, one of uh, part of this vibrant and. Sol altta mute var. Ona basacaksınız. En sol altta vibrant community of uh, Istanbul. Uh, so we know that Mr. Valery's enterprise was a success story, and soon after, he became one of the most popular confectioners of Istanbul. Uh, from the Ottoman Star State Archives, we learned that he became the Şekerli Müci Şehriyari, the chief imperial confectioner of the palace. Uh, and another journal journal article from 1860 informs us that Monsieur Valery had received a diamond ring from Sultan Abdul Majid uh, in exchange for his services. So this is a success story. He moved from Torino and became the confectioner of the palace uh, in, a, in a couple of decades. 
And in the Ottoman state archives, you also find some letters written by uh, Francesco Valeri, uh, for uh, Grand Vizier Ali Pasha in French. So these letters addressed to the, to the uh, sublime court uh, asks for some payments, and we learn from these letters that he was very uh, important and prominent uh, serving for the events of the state and the palace. Um, and in the, in the state archives, of course, we uh, learn more about Valerie. He was referred as Italian Francesco Valerie, uh, Itali uh, Italian François Valerie, as it says in the, in the archive. Uh, so, also Sadatula's dissertation informs us that the family was registered as Italian in the uh, in the Istanbul's Latin Catholic Church, as well as in the records of Societa Operaia. Nilay, if I can ask you to speak up a tiny bit, please. It's The volume is quite low. Is it? Yeah. It, yeah okay, it, I, I think I, I need to hold this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's otherwise, thank you, that's better. Yeah, I wish I had ordered this professional mics. <laughs> um, okay, um, so Francesco Valeri passed away in 1867 at the height of his career, and his wife, Madame Valeri, and his son uh, and daughter continued the family business. We know it because in the 11th Herald, we learned that Monsieur Valeri was served in the opening ceremony of the tunnel, the tunnel, you know, the second. Um, the metro line in the world. So um, during the opening ceremony, according to the article, aperitifs, champagne and wine were served and the general director of the project proposed a toast for the health of Sultan Abdulaziz. So the, the family tradition continued under uh, Valerie's name. And uh, we also know that the daughter of Francesco Valerie got married to Louis Le Bon, who also owned a cafe. Um, Café Le Bon, and uh, he also became the chef, I mean, chief confectioner in 80, 1899. Uh, we learned it from the Ottoman state archives. So according to an advertisement, um, Maison Louis Le Bon was right across from the Russian embassy on Grand Rue de Pera again. And today on Istika Street, there still exists a Café Le Bon, um, as many of you know might know, uh, which kind of you know, resembles this Belle Epoque period of the region. And uh, it's known that Monsieur Le Bon later opened Café Marquis, again on Grand Rue de Perra, and it's at the entrance of Marquis Passage. This is a very delightful café, and it's one of the rare remaining representatives of the period with its very nice decorative and architectural details, especially the ceramic Art Nouveau panels representing the four seasons, only two of them left, but uh, it's, it's a very characteristic emblem of the cafe. So it's like a living memoir of the delightful lifestyle and cosmopolitan cultural sphere of the late 19th century era. Okay. So um, this gives an idea about the background of the, the Valerie family and how they kind of took part in the very vibrant cultural landscape of uh, Istanbul at that time. So today, uh, I'll, I'll talk more about our architect, uh, Alessandro, or Alexander Valerie. I have two screens, so. Okay, so we don't know much about his earlier life. He was born in 1850 as a third child of this Italian, uh, Italian and Greek family. Uh, and he's a Ottoman Levantine. So, the earliest documentation about his uh, life starts with his education in Paris, Ecole des Beaux-Arts. Uh, when we go to the Paris archives uh, of Ecole des Beaux-Arts, we can see his student registers. Uh, so from these documents, we learn that uh, he started school in Paris, architectural education in Paris, 1868. And uh, he remained in Paris almost for 10 years and trained in the atelier of Monsieur Coca. So let me talk a little bit about um, Ecole de Beaux-Arts, why it's so important, because it's one of the very rooted and very important institutions of the time. It was founded during the 17th century 
and by the 19th century, it was the most prestigious school of art and architecture in the world. And young people from all around the world uh, came to Paris, received this education, but also had this accord, you know, this, uh, having this vision of architecture, art and architecture uh, in this school. And uh, this, this accord spreads all around the world, uh, thanks to these young students. So Valerie was one of them one of the rare representatives of the Ottomans in the school. So the architectural style of uh, Bozar includes historicism and eclecticism, especially in decorative details and facade design, which means that you can take um, historic examples and just paste it in your facade, uh, but also axiality, symmetry, and emphasis on the plan in terms of you know, functionality and rationality is also very important. And um, the use of neoclassical forms as well as new materials and technology uh, responding to the changing needs of the society at that time, modernizing world, is very important. So uh, we can we'll all see this kind of eclecticism uh, and rational planning symmetry, etc., in Valerie's designs when we have a look at his buildings. Okay, so um, let me talk a little bit about his personal life. Uh, again, not much is known about Valerie. He's kind of a discreet figure. We don't have many pictures of him. We don't know about his uh, personal life. Again, Seda's dissertation finds some clues about his life. Um, he came back to Istanbul in 1880 and got married to Maria Constantia Scuro in 1883. And the couple had a child named, named Antoine. Uh, but the couple get divorced in 1901, and the same year Alexander got married to a French woman named Marie Mathilde uh, Chavin, and the couple had a child named Francois in 1918. So the, this is what we basically know about his personal life. But in terms of his professional life, we know that his encounter with Osman Hamdi became a turning point in the architect's uh, career. So we all know Osman Hamdi. He's, he's this uh, world famous bureaucrat, painter, intellectual, and a self trained archaeologist. And he also had uh, the training of law and um, painting in Paris. Maybe they, they might have met uh, during these years, or maybe they, uh, they met at uh, Edifa's, Edifa Art Society's uh, activities. Uh, of which Valerie had attended in 1880 after his return to Istanbul. So Osman Amdi wrote about Valerie's works, architectural drawings, that he would be extremely happy if he were able to provide details about the architectural drawings of Monsieur Valerie, but he would have needed many more pages for this. So it's a very important phrase. Um, and it, that was not it. Osman Hamdi invited Valerie to design the School of Ar uh, the Academy of Fine Arts, the School of Architecture and Arts in Istanbul. So the first School of Arts and Architecture was established under the direction of Osman Hamdi, and Valerie became not only the designer of the school, the architect of the school, but he became the first professor of architectural department. So it was a very big step in his life. And here we can see the group of students and professors, Osman Hamdi being at the center on the front row and on his left, we can see Valerie uh, as a group of uh, Academy of Fine Arts people. All right. Um, sorry for that. I kind of lost my... Okay, my mouse accidentally clicked on stop video. Um, so collaboration between Osman Hamdi and Valerie continued and Valerie designed the second wing of the Academy of Fine Arts and also designed the new museum building of which Osman Hamdi was the director as well. So this is all, we all know this is the uh, Ottoman Imperial Museum, Asara Tika Musesi, the first wing of it, right across the tiled pavilion, 
uh, in the outer gardens of the Topkapı Palace. And this is, uh, this is the plan of the first phase. And we can see that it's a very typical neoclassical building um, with triangular pediments, colonnaded portico, very symmetrical, designed with neoclassical details. And the rationality of the plan is very obvious. It is basically designed for the sarcophagi found in Sidon by Osman Hamdi. So it is the house of, uh, house of sarcophagi. And when we have a look at the interior, uh, we can see that uh, it's a very modern uh, designed according to the universally accepted norms, architectural norms of a museum. And this is the third phase of the building and circulating the tile pavilion. Uh, you know, the right and left wings were added later on uh, during the time. And here we can see the completed project. It became together with the Academy of Fine Arts an introverted campus of art and archaeology uh, under the direction of Osman Hamdi. Very modern, very European, very westernized. You know, you can see uh, something like this um, in any European city. All right. So um, to sum up, Alexander Valery became a prominent figure in the architectural arena of the la late 19th century. And his architecture is defined as historic historicist and eclectic, blending forms from Islamic, Ottoman, Seljukid past uh, with classical Baroque or Renaissance elements. We're going to be seeing all about this in a moment. Apparently, Valery and his style were widely accepted by the ver various social segments of the Ottoman society. His commissioning of many projects by Muslim, non-Muslim, Ottoman, or European circles uh, would be accepted as a proof of approval. The newspapers of the era praised his works, his buildings fulfilling the newly emerging needs of the society diverged from the tra traditional construction methods. His buildings represented the modern with their new forms, technological advancements, and novel designs. And we know that he worked for the government. He had several medals, as we can uh, tell from the Ottoman State Archives. Um, uh, he has a professorship status, and he also worked for the community, for diverse community uh, in Ottoman Istanbul, very cosmopolitan society, as we'll be seeing in a moment. Okay. Okay, so we just talked about Academy of Fine Arts, so I won't get into detail. Uh, one of his earliest works was designed for Abraham Eremyan Pasha, an Ottoman Armenian businessman and a bureaucrat. And he also had close relations with Egypt at that time. And this building, Sarkin Dorian, as we all know, is a very grand monumental uh, masonry building on uh, Grand Rue de Pera, uh, which became a, a stage for a very violent renovation uh, a couple of years ago. As can remember the uh, with the MX cinemas and everything, but we'll talk about that maybe at another presentation. So uh, he also designed a mansion at the hills of Chamnija for uh, Crown Prince Prince Vahdettin Efendi, as you can see. Um, he designed a small mosque in Emilunu, and we can see it's it's a very small elegant and refined mosque and designed with eclectic and oriental architectural vocabulary. I totally love this mosque. If you happen to go to any and try to visit it, it's mostly closed, but even, you know, from the facade, it's, it's very impressive to have a look at. Um, Ottoman Imperial Bank, we'll be talking about this in detail in a mm. moment. Parapalas, the same way, so um, I shift quickly. Um, the Kugis house, it's a private residence at Para, a smaller scale, very typical Para apartment with some eclectic details. You can see, and uh, this time a building for the French community in Istanbul, Union Francaise. Uh, today it is being used by Istanbul Modern 
only the facade of the building remains intact. So unfortunately, the rest was uh, damaged due to a fire. And mm -hmm. one of his very majestic, very important buildings is located on the hills of the historic peninsula. It's the public debt administration building built, built for the European community who was controlling the, the budget of the Ottomans. So uh, very significant uh, structure in terms of architecture, but politically and economically as well. So we can see the use of eclectic forms and traditional uh, patterns uh, derived from Ottoman and Seljukit architecture integrated in this uh, monumental building, uh, which has very decorative elements as well. And Denis Turkar in her yeah. dissertation talks about uh, how Valerie was one of the architects of Abdul Hamid and he designed several uh, annexes in the Yildiz Palace. This is one of them, Yenibahçe Kiosk, a very European uh, standard mansion at the, at the hills of Yildiz. Let's see um, another hybrid, uh, very interesting structure. It's Yeniköy Afifbaşı Yildiz'ı, a timber structure, very beautiful. And of course, one of his uh, major works was together with uh, Raimondo Daranko. It's the Imperial School uh, of Medicine uh, at the shores of Asian shores of Bosphorus at Haidar Pasha. Um, again, a, a significant uh, monument of the 19th century, a, a monument of modernization and up to them its you know, vision. Uh, and yeah, let's, let's finalize with this small but very beautifully designed uh, monument at Kadıköy Pier uh, erected for the for the uh, up to the uh, anniversary. So to sum up, uh, I mean, I showed you a bunch of pictures one after another just to show you how Valerie's architectural language is so vibrant and so eclectic. Uh, he's using Ottoman traditional and historic forms together with European or quote unquote Orientalist elements. So he was an Ottoman citizen with French, with French education, and he was also a French citizen with Greek and Italian uh, parents. So he represented the liminal and cosmopolitan characteristics of the Levantine culture. His architecture was a reflection of this hybrid in between in multiple identities. So uh, in the second part of my presentation, I'll be talking more in detail about uh, some of his selected works. If I'm over time, okay, please uh, let me stop because I I'll be just showing some examples to better understand his, his architectural style and his vision uh, and how his you know, uh, cosmopolitan identity shaped his hybrid and eclectic uh, architectural vocabulary. Um, this is Ottoman Imperial Bank, together with the tobacco monopoly, uh, Tutun Vejusi and Bank Osmani Shahane, at Galata, Voivoda Street. And um, the bank was founded by French and British capital. Nila, if I could ask you to hold the microphone again, please. Oh, okay. Thank Sorry, you. I just okay. um, I forgot about it. Thank you. All right. Uh, so the bank became. Um, the Imperial Bank of the Ottoman Empire and a headquarters building was built at Voivoda Street, uh, the vibrant financial and trade center of the city. And um, it, was, it was a twin building on the street. As you can see, the left part is for the tobacco monopoly and the right side is for the Imperial Bank. And uh, when we have a look at its plan, you know, it is very typical uh, bazaar planning with you know symmetry and rationality, a central hall, you know, um, latest architectural technology was used, the vaults were brought from London and the building was constructed uh, over it. Uh, so it kind of reflected the modern 
elegant and refined architectural uh, style of gallery. And when when you have a uh, have access to the building, um, you can still feel this quality of space and the refinement of the material and workmanship in the building. Okay, and of course uh, the central hall of the bank building, a very typical of Valerie's architecture. It is a modern monumental bank creating a sense of trust and stability and credibility when you have a look at the building. This is the feeling that you get. And when we have a look at the facade, um, it's a very typical neo-Renaissance facade, a very typical choice for financial structures all around the world, especially in Europe. So it reflects the standardized architectural language of Bozar, you know, symmetric, neoclassical. Um, so we can see here that uh, the, the architect actually designed uh, this, this building and signed it. So it is from the Salt Research Archives. And the building became a style marker in the Voivoda Street, which is today Bankalar Jatisi, Bankalar, the Bank Street, uh, because later the, the street would be filled with many similar financial structures um, following the style and scale of the Ottoman Bank. But when you have a look at this building from the, from the historic peninsula, uh, from the Golden Horn, uh, there is a totally different architectural expression. Because let's have a look at the, uh, the, the facade in detail. It was elaborated with large ears, timber projections, oval windows, undulating surfaces. It's an asymmetrical facade broken into multiple volumes. And it kind of integrated into the local fabric. Totally different from the uh, front facade of the building. So the architect here, as you can see, reflects this hybrid language, hybrid architectural language, reflecting multiple ide his multiple identities. So the dignified and somber front facade contrasts with the playful and joyful uh, back facade. See, so what I uh, suggest this the architect is paying a tribute to the historic, historic peninsula because of course he's a Levantine but he was a subject of the Ottoman Empire he was born in Istanbul he knows the city and he appreciates the architecture and the urban landscape of the capital and today um, we all know that the Ottoman Imperial Bank is converted into a cultural center named Salt Galata. So we can, it's open to public. We can just go and appreciate Valerie's architecture even after this uh, very dense uh, renovation project. All right. So um, let me talk about Para Palace Hotel. I'm talking really fast, not to take too much of your time, <laughs> but um, please let me know if you have questions whatsoever. Um, let's talk about Para Palace. Um, but before talking about uh, Para Palace, uh, let me talk about the Orient Express. Why this hotel was built in the capital? Because the Rumili Shiman uh, or Orient Express connecting European capitals to Constantinople was executed during 1870s. And finally, uh, the line reached Sirkeci. So the line was run by an international company known as Wagon D. And these luxurious trains started from Paris and brought their uh, elite passengers in seven days from Paris or London or Vienna to the Ottoman capital. So finally, this exotic capital of the Ottoman Empire became part of the grand tour of the Ottoman elites and became a hot spot for European tourism. So there was a problem. Uh, where to accommodate these uh, upper scale elite guests when they arrive to the city? We need hotels to accommodate them. So the company, Wagon D, 
they commissioned a luxurious hotel at Tatabashi to house their clients. So immediately after coming to the city uh, with the Orient Express, they were transferred to the Para Palace Hotel. And the hotel was built uh, next to the Tepebashi Gardens, uh, which was initiated by the sixth municipal district of Istanbul. And um, it has amazing views overlooking the historic peninsula and the Golden Horn. Again, let's have a look at the, the facade and architectural features of the, of the building. Um, it's a six-story building with neo-Renaissance style, very robust and classical, creating a sense of quality and trust for the visitors. And, you know, it's, it's a very typical uh, European building. So the European uh, visitors seeing this building from outside would, would feel comfortable um, getting in and, you know, staying over there. But uh, also, when we have a look at the, the section of the building, it reflects the Beaux-Arts principles. Uh, it was built in the state of the art technology of the time. There's a central gallery, an elevator, and individual rooms. As you can see in the, in the plan, very typical of Valerie, you know, the, the rooms were organized around the central hall. So there's nothing uh, abnormal or there's nothing foreign, uh, it's a very Western, very universal uh, typology. But when we have a look at the interior, we kind of have a very different taste, a totally different atmosphere was created, um, stimulating the luxury and exotism of the Orient. And, you know, these foreign guests were craving uh, for these exotic details. They want to uh, discover the oriental capital and, you know, looking for some exotic details uh, over there. So Valerie, you know, purposefully created this atmosphere of a oriental palace and um, implemented an orientalist vocabulary in this hotel, uh, which is very much appreciated by the foreign visitors, so I'm showing a couple pictures uh, from the interior of the hotel. So yet again, uh, we can see this double arch architectural style of Valerie reflecting the architect's multiple identities, Eastern, Western, Ottoman and European, local and foreign. So he was you know, consciously playing with these forms to create different atmospheres and different feelings uh, for the ones coming in. So the architect held his various identities without conflict in the multicultural and cosmopolitan environment of the late 19th century. The architect was shifting back and forth among, among his various identities. Alexander has also changed his, the spelling of his last name from Valauri to Valerie, depending on the context, the nature of the projects, and identity of his patrons. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the left image is not really well seen, but it is, um, you know, from the, from the facade of the Kugis house where he wrote his name with an I at the end, you know, the Italian version of his last name. Uh, I don't know why it's not very, very visible over here. Um, and when actually uh, he was shifting between his identities, but he became a French citizen uh, in 1897, uh, as, as remarked in this Ottoman document, France devlet, devlet tebaasından Alexandros Valori Kalfa. So he became a French citizen and uh, this is a fountain designed by Alexander Valery. It was dated 1912, and it is now in the gardens of the French embassy today. Um, the inscription says that the chimney tiles of the, um, of the fountain was gifted by uh, Crown Prince, Prince Abdul Mejid to the wife of the French ambassador, Madame Bonaparte. 
So it's a very interesting pattern because we see an exact uh, identical of this pattern, uh, at least the chili part, in Abdul Hamid uh, Abdul Majid Efendi's mansion at Balarbasha. So if I have time, I'll be talking about uh, Abdul Majid Efendi mansion. Uh, if not, I can stop here. Is it okay for me to continue? All right. If there are no objections, let me talk about this very, very beautiful mansion uh, designed by Valerie. Uh, this, is, this is the fountain that I, uh, I just mentioned. Um, so actually this one is designed for the former Khedive of Egypt, Ismail Pasha, during 1880s. So it's one of the earliest works of Valerie. Uh, it is at Balar Bashu, the Asian uh, hills of um, Constantinople. And it is one of the finest examples of timber workmanship. It's very well preserved. And it was later purchased by Abdul Hamid II and given uh, to his nephew and royal heir, Abdul Majid Efendi, as a residence. And it is a unique combination of Eastern and Western elements, a majestic, majestic work of timber architecture with its refined details, as you can see, large eaves, uh, window proportions, the decorative details. It's a very impressive, very beautiful building. And luckily, we have some uh, pictures from the period of Abdul Majid in his old albums, and we can see the central pool, uh, a marble pool at the central sofa of the building, and uh, the statue of Abdul Aziz, uh, equestrian statue of Abdul Aziz, which was transferred from the Topka Palace and placed in this mansion, because we all know that Abdul Majid Efendi was a uh, person of arts and culture, and he was very much into painting and music and use this mansion as a gathering space for cultural and intellectual meetings. So uh, today we see the, the marble pool the, in the central sofa, and today it is also used by um, to exhibit Omar Kort's private collection. So I was lucky enough to visit the building and see the collection uh, two years ago, I think. And it was a very well-preserved building, one of the rare examples uh, of timber interior, as you can see. And when we have a look at Abdul Majid Efendi's albums, we can see the same interior, but there's this uh, musical group performing under the patronage of Abdul Majid, as you can see. And of course, I have to mention this very beautiful uh, painting by Abdul Majid Efendi himself, Harem de Beethoven, um, Beethoven in the Harem. And we can see the statue of Abdul Aziz at the, at the background, if you can uh, see it uh, over there. So this is the very same mansion, uh, mansion of Abdul Majid, uh, uh, and you know, a very vibrant scene, uh, a performance, music performance. But I also need to show this while I'm talking about Abdul Majid Efendi, Avluda um, Kadınlar, or Woman in the Courtyard uh, painting of this. Um, talented architect. Um, and let me start, uh, let me finish my presentation with another timber building, uh, which I really admire. And uh, this is, again, designed for the same company, uh, Wagon Lee, because the, the owners of the Para Palace Hotel, they, it was so profitable, uh, obviously, they, they just wanted to have another hotel, this, ta this time not in Pera, but over the hills of Prinkipo, one of the princess islands in Istanbul. And it was located at, at the highest hill of the island. So um, for some reason, uh, the project started in uh, late eight, 1890s and came to finish by 1902, but Abdul II did not issue a permit for this hotel and casino, and um, the building became, you know, uh, they didn't know what to do with the building, and finally it was bought by Madame Eleni Zarifi, a wife of a very prominent Greek banker of the time, and it was given to the Greek ecumenical patriarchate, and 
it was designated as an orphanage housing hundreds of Greek uh, children until 1964. Um, so due to the increasing tension between Greece and Turkey at the time, the orphanage was closed uh, like uh, at one night and, um, and remained idle until today. So uh, the ownership has had some, uh, had some issues. Uh, there was some uh, law debate between uh, the Greek Patriarchate and uh, Turkish government, but eventually the building was the largest timber building of Europe and the second largest uh, timber building of the world, left for decades, for many decades. So today um, it is waiting to be rescued and this, this magnificent building is decaying every other day. It's a masterpiece of Valery, one of his latest works. And of course, it's not very durable against rain and climatic conditions because of its material, but um, it still is expecting to be uh, rescued. And in uh, 2018, the building was declared as a World Heritage Site uh, in danger by Europa Nostra and the mesmerizing site of memory is waiting to be saved. So this is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. I'm expecting any questions now or later. Thanks again. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Nilay. Um, so uh, if you have a question, raise your hand um, using the hand tool or turn on your video and wave. And does anyone have a a question. Um, perhaps, does, do I see anyone at the moment? Okay, maybe if I just sort of lead with, ah, Philip, Philip Mansell. Thank, thank you, Nilay, for that wonderful talk. Could you say, just a point of fact, where are Abdul Majid Effendi's photograph albums now that you use? They are in the archives of the um, Turkey Büyük Millet Meclisi at the Assembly, Turkish National Assembly, right now. In in Dolmabahçe Palace? No, no, no. In the in the Majlis, in the National Assembly. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank very you. Welcome. And I would like to thank you, Gizem Pongo. I think she must be here for uh, pointing this source to my attention. She was really kind to let me know about the album. Anyone else with a question at the moment? Um, I think Shebnam Shemyanar has raised her hand. Do you want to ask I, I do, I do, I do, I do. Okay, Shebnam. Okay, one. can you hear me? I, I just wondered, what is the status of Parapolis at the moment? Is it um, some sort of a foundation? How is it uh, being run? Do you have any idea? Oh, yes. Yes, um, it is actually, um, it had been very successfully renovated by uh, Kaba. Hold your microphone again, please, Nilay. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, it had been uh, successfully renovated by Kaba Architects, and today it's, it's a five-star hotel. I mean, uh, remaining its original function, uh, we can see more or less the same architectural details, very well preserved. Uh, of course, the... Um, the decorative details and, you know, some technological advancements mm -hmm. were made, but um, it, it basically uh, uh, kept its original spatial quality and it's open to public. Uh, is it a private, a private uh, owned uh, or, or is it some sort of foundation? Um, no, 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 it's a, it's a foreign chain. Um, All I right. Think, uh, it's Shangri-La as far as I remember. All right. Yeah. 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 Why not? Yes. Uh, great work of Ninai uh, for so many uh, buildings that we knew, but I never know who the architect was. I have a question. What year was the Pera Palace built and how many years it took to build uh, that building? Uh, let me double check. It was, I think, uh, 1894 that it was opened. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, 
uh, yeah, 1884 or 83, uh, it took, uh, I mean, two years or so. There are more detailed uh, information on the journals, uh, you know, the starting of the project, the ending of the project. There are some different dates, 84 or 83, but, you know, a couple years. Uh, at that. Great, thank you. you oh, Jaren? Uh, Milai, thank you. Uh, I, my question is about the family. Uh, you mentioned that you received French uh, citizenship. So I was wondering if the family was uh, ex quote unquote expatriated to France during World War I and like what happened to the family? Um, Seda had a very detailed research about the family and actually uh, Seda and myself met one of the uh, Grand grand uh, nephews of Valerie in Rome a couple years ago. Uh, well, it, it's kind of complicated because the the family is Ottoman, uh, but they had Italian roots. But some, I mean, two of the uh, one of the sisters and brothers, I think they moved to United States uh, during the time of the uh, ex, uh, you know exposition. 1889 exposition uh, so they they remained there and came back later and Valerie himself he took the French citizenship and he remained in the in Istanbul uh, until fo the fall of Abdul Hamid I think he moved to uh, Grasse uh, in France in 1911, you know, uh, when the young Turks uh, were in power. So, you know, it's, it's kind of complicated. Some part of the family moved back to Italy, some, uh, some of them moved to France, but I don't think anyone remained in, in Istanbul, as, as far as we know. Uh, by the way, the, the Para Palace Hotel was 1894. I'm sorry, it's not 84, it's 94. Okay, check thank you. Okay. Uh, April. Me? Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you, my. Uh, she's a friend uh, from university time. Uh, thank you, Nilay, for this great uh, presentation. Uh, I always wondered that large timber building uh, from Princess Island. I didn't know uh, that uh, it it is built by uh, Valerie. Uh, is this only because uh, it is a uh, material of local material of the island? Uh, why didn't he build by uh, a durable material? Why uh, such a uh, I, I, I saw the carvings or um, all the uh, four-story buildings? Uh, I always wonder why he, he used. Uh, uh, yeah. Not strong material, and I would like to add something uh, because I know uh, very soon uh, there is an attempt to restore uh, the building, so uh, it would not uh, corrupt uh, or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know the results, but there is an attempt for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Istanbul Büyükşehir Belediyesi, the Istanbul Municipality. Uh, took the, the uh, project for taking the measured drawings of the building, which is a very important step in its restoration. Uh, there had been a very serious campaign um, going on for the last couple of years, especially there was this very impressive uh, exhibition by Hera Büktaşcian, uh, yeah. I think uh, two years uh, earlier, and they published a very um, nice book in an exhibition about the history of the um, uh, of Prinkitu Palace or Greek orphanage and at that time we had several discussions about why it was built in timber um, honestly we don't have any documentation I mean we don't know if the, the company asked for it if the architects it was architects decision whatsoever uh, we can only speculate and my speculation is that I mean he's familiar with um, different materials. He, except for concrete, he used masonry and timber very skillfully. This is, this is what I tried to present here. So it's, it's not a foreign material for him to 
to use. It's the local material of the time and it's the local material of the island. And we also talked with Korhan Gümüş, you know, it would be very, very difficult to carry all this masonry uh, material to the hills of the uh, mm -hmm. island with that technology, you know, it's because there are not, no natural stone resources and but there are lots of timber uh, available, which is lighter. Um, so it, it must have been a problem of logistics and also the, the of course, the local um, fabric of, of uh, the island, you know, we, he, he really wanted to kind of fit into this atmosphere, I believe, which is, uh, which is quite a decent, you know, choice, um, for my opinion. Um, okay, well, uh, just, so I think Alison, did you have a question then, Shebnam? Yeah. Alison first? You need to unmute. Yeah, there we go. Hi. Um, I, this might just be my own ignorance of um, traditional architecture, but I'm curious about what was very European about the um, Kanak for the um, Egyptian minister and that, if any, then became... Uh I think it is. Uh, I wouldn't say it's very European. It's it's uh, it's a very hybrid building. But when you have a look at the plan and the symmetry, you know the organization of the plan, uh, you know the entrance, the access, whatsoever. I think we can see some kind of bazaar uh, principles in the building. Not uh, not necessarily any you know European or neoclassical details, honestly. But you know just some Orientalist forms. Uh, that is European and, you know, like the, the overall organization of the space. Okay, Shebnam? I was going to say about Ebru's uh, uh, question that wasn't there a concern on earthquake at the time? I mean, there were a lot of buildings in Istanbul were built with uh, wood and then, then followed a lot of big fires uh, uh, during that time because of the wood. Uh, but yeah. was there an issue of earthquake at the time? I think there... Definitely. I mean, uh, there were two main concerns for the building, the fire and the earthquake. There was a big fire, the Para fire of 1877, I suppose, and another earthquake, 1894. So they were really devastating for the city. So the, uh, of course, there were some um, legal or administrative uh, precautions to prevent the fire, like building firewalls, etc. And timber was preferred uh, because of the um, the threat of the earthquake. But I'm not sure if it was very decisive mm. in the selection of materials, because mm. as you can see, he, he used both materials, uh, both timber and both masonry. So um, I don't know if at that time they were aware of the fact that the, uh, the file line it goes underneath the <laughs> island, so uh, I, I'm not really sure about. Yes, you never know. <laughs> you never know, exactly. <laughs> okay, James. So, Nilay, I have a I have a more big picture question. Um, I, I'm I'm interested in the way the Beaux Arts exported this neoclassical style to. Um, all around the world, basically. Um, and they, they seem to have re-imported neoclassical style to Constantinople. If you look at, um, if you look at classical reconstructions of, of what Constantinople used to look like, um, it used to look like ancient Rome. And that tradition of neoclassic or classical architecture seems to have disappeared with the Ottomans and been re-imported via the Renaissance and via the Beaux Arts back into Constantinople. So my question is, is there any indigenous Ottoman uh, continuation of, neo -cla of classical architecture um, in between, you know, 1453 and the end of the 19th century? It's a very difficult question because we're talking about such a long durée. Um, and honestly, I think the, the Byzantine Empire, or the Eastern Roman Empire, had also lost its essence for 
uh, classical architecture when it comes to the 15th century. So, um, yeah, there were like these colonnades and messe and grand structures, but I think the, uh, the grand inspiration would be Hagia Sophia. I mean, it, it is more like Greek architecture with domes. Uh, I think that, that, was the, uh, that was the real uh, reminiscence of the, of the Byzantine heritage, which was very well adopted by Mimar Sinan. Uh, so it is, I think they, they kind of lost their uh, neoclassical edge, uh, especially after the Latin invasion um, of the 10th century. So after that, I, uh, I don't think not very much has remained of this classical, old classical uh, era in the, in the capital. And was it, was it controversial building these very European style buildings or was the whole culture receptive, so, so receptive at that point it wasn't controversial? No, no, not really because uh, it started actually with, with the Sultan himself, like very top down. Uh, we know that there are like Greek, Armenian architects who were very, um, very active. Uh, kind of shaping the architectural fabric of the city at that time. And, you know, Ottoman Empire was not a closed box as we, we kind of imagine it to be. It was very, it had very vibrant relationships with the Europe. Uh, so anything that's, that's fashionable in Europe comes uh, to the empire quite quickly. So I don't really necessarily take it as westernization, like a grand ideology, but it was the trend of the time and Ottomans kind of adapted well because they were kind of integrated especially in the Mediterranean basin you know uh, with other, other other European countries so as always we find a pl pl plural <laughs> plurality of forms in the empire sometimes neoclassical sometimes neo -or orientalist uh, sometimes very traditional uh, you know, 16th century architecture being repeated. So it's, it's a multiplicity of uh, styles and architectural vocabularies. So I don't think it was controversial at all. It all started with the 18th century anyhow, you know, with uh, Western forms being integrated in, uh, in the Ottoman landscape. Okay, anyone else? Oh yeah, uh, Fahri. You're on mute. Oh, I can't hear you. I can do Do you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, all right. Thank you so much for this amazing talk. And um, my question is about the Istanbul Arche Archaeological Museum. So, um, uh, when we look at the buildings uh, of Valeri. Uh, working with Ottoman government. He uh, mainly uh, cho uh, chose um, the eclectic, eclectic buildings. But uh, when we look at the uh, Istanbul Archaeological Museum, it's very an anomalous uh, building when we uh, look at the Topkapı Palace complex. Why he, uh, why he didn't choose uh, to build this building in eclectic uh, style, and why he chose the uh, uh, classical, neoclassical style uh, 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 for Istanbul Archaeological Museum, because this is very anomalous. Uh, there is not any re related with tiled kirsch uh, uh, in this complex. Um, and why <laughs> uh, he, he chose this? Uh, <laughs> style uh, for Istanbul Archaeological Museum? Uh, it's a very good question and um, I, I, I did my PhD dissertation on the Topka Palace, on the 19th century of the Topka Palace. So I asked this question to myself and I don't have an answer. Uh, again, I can speculate. Uh, first of all, the building was planned um, as a timber structure in the beginning due to the you know, costs uh, uh, limitations. But later on, I think there was, there was some kind of bargaining with the government and after them it decided the, 
you know, give them the money and the, the building ended up being two stories instead of one and masonry instead of timber. So that is one thing. Um, it was, yes, built right across the Targ Pavilion, which is a 15th century masterpiece. It's a, you know, heritage. Uh, it's an architectural heritage from the, from the period of Fatih Sultan Mehmed. And it totally encirculates the, the building um, without respecting its, you know, uh, historical significance. Um, it's totally designed in a very European, very westernized manner. And it turns it, its back to the top of the palace. No visual, no physical connections with the palace at all. So what I speculate is that Osman Amdi wanted to create this little campus, you know, this westernized, isolated academy for himself. You know, the art students going to the museum and drawing, you know, making drawings of the ancient uh, sculptures. And it was, it was designed as a house for this, these Hellenistic sarcophagi. So everything over there, um, at least until the end of the 19th century, was, was specifically you know, uh, neoclassical. Neoclassical ar archaeology was the, was the prime material. Then later, there was a little section for the Islamic arts and coins whatsoever, but it was majorly a, a temple for the, for the archaeological findings. And plus, they really wanted to have this modern institution and have a look all around the world at that time. No country had anything but neoclassical. So they just wanted to adapt to this, you know, very universal style of architecture, um, to, just to show that Ottomans are modern enough to build and accommodate such a uh, you know, fantastic uh, building in European standards, you know, not, no need to be eclectic or whatsoever. Um, maybe that's why, but I mean, um, I'm open to suggestions, of course. I don't know the answer. All right, thank you. Thank you. But Shebnam, did you have another question? Okay. Uh, any other questions from anybody? Um, uh, if I've got one, if I may, Nilay. Um, of course. Is, is there any sense that um, Valerie was a celebrity architect in the same way that some of modern architects are, like Norman Foster and so on? Was there that same sort of culture and admiration for these prestigious projects? Um, I suppose so. I mean, I, I would call him a star architect of his time because he built like almost 50 buildings, you know, he realized 50 buildings in his lifetime. Uh, and it's, it's an amazing number. He worked for Abdul Hamid, he worked for the uh, intelligentsia, for the royal family, for the Europeans, you know, um, he works for like all segments of the society and he was very well respected. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but the thing is, we don't know anything about his personal life, you know, we just, uh, maybe we should do more um, journal, you know, scanning to, to have more clues about Valerie's life, but it, it seems quite discreet um, based on our current findings. So he was a star, but, you know, um, I, he was a prominent figure in the, in the social circles. We, we hear news about um, his attending to, you know, Parapalace opening ceremony, uh, or, uh, you know, being a member of the uh, Societe Operaia, um, Union Française, or Circus Dorian. So he was part of this elite crowd, um, apparently. So if it, that answers your question. But I don't know how popular he was as a, as a, as a person. Okay, thank you. Um, so unless there are any other questions, I suggest we call it a day. Any, anyone want to have a last question to Nilay? Oh, James. Need to unmute? Yeah, okay. Yes. I will. Um, a very, very quick informational question. When you showed those two inscriptions of uh, Valerie's name, one in Italian uh -huh. and one in yeah. French or whatever, right. whichever uh -huh. language it was, you didn't say where the second one was. Oh, okay. The first one is from the De Cugis house. It's like yeah. an Italian patron. 
And the second one is from the fountain uh, in the French embassy. Okay, thank uh, so you. Th this is the fountain I talked about. I just uh, want to see if I could see it, that's all. Thank you. It's, it's still in um, Palais de France, in the gardens of it. Okay. Um, well, uh, Nilay, thank you so much for your very interesting talk. Excellent photographs, a lot I've, I've never seen before. Um, and thank you everybody for your questions and, and contributions. I, I hope you uh, enjoyed the event um, and uh, that you will join us again um, in December or in January. Oh, Alison, is that a, an applause or, or question? Applause. <laughs> so <laughs> applause, you know, we do the virtual. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me. And thanks for the thank questions, you for attending. they were all great. Thank you. Okay, goodbye. Bye-bye.